And I think the most I miss is his phone calls at night telling me about his day or sending me pictures about what he was making or stuff like that, his smile. It really grabs at me to hear a mother talking about what she misses most about her son, someone that she hasn't seen in over eight years. Investigators think that he jumped from a bridge, but many people question how a young man who was using crutches to walk with a broken foot and also had a broken thumb could have climbed that railing. His mother does think that he is deceased, but she thinks it's due to foul play. However, we don't really know for sure since his body has never been recovered. It's time to turn on the searchlight for Jake Lachelet. Welcome back to Brain Scratch Searchlight. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for caring about these cases like I do. For today's case, we're heading to the city of Baton Rouge, the capital for the state of Louisiana here in the United States. Wikipedia notes that Baton Rouge, which translates to red stick, is located on the eastern bank of the Mississippi River. Since 2020, it has been the second largest city in Louisiana, right after New Orleans. The city proper has a population of over 220,000 people. It was August 29th of 2014 when a 911 operator in Baton Rouge took the first of two distressing phone calls. It came in around 2.46 a.m. And thanks to the Unfound podcast and the work of this mother, those calls are now available online. Let's go ahead and listen to the first one. 911, where is your emergency? Hey, how you doing? Look, uh, I'm, a, I'm a truck driver and I'm going Mm-hmm. Um, I was just calling. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Look, I was just calling. Uh, they got a like an old pickup truck. It's on top of the uh, this to the bridge. Mm-hmm. Well, I was kind of skeptical because it don't have no blinker going and the lights on, but I don't see nobody on inside the truck. Kind of spooky, you know. Okay, and Maybe they were also going westbound. The caller was then transferred to the Baton Rouge City Police Department to report to them what he had seen. But a few minutes later, at 2.49, another, even more urgent call came in. 911, where is your emergency? Yes, ma'am, you got a truck on the other swing of the west side, west side of the bridge. Stop. Uh, according to the radio, six foot dog water just jumped over the bridge. Oh, okay. Police were dispatched to the scene, and upon arriving, they did find the truck. They also found that the truck belonged to 22-year-old Jake Lachelet. Jake Allen Lachelet was born to Tina Leclerc and George Lachelet on June 17, 1992. On Crime Door's YouTube channel, Tina describes Jake as her highly intelligent middle child who would dive into topics and learn extremely quickly. A hard worker, Jake was actually working three jobs at the time of his disappearance. His mother says that at the age of 22, Jake had experienced more than a lot of people do in their entire lifetimes. Jake also had a young daughter. He loved to fish, work on cars, and he was also an artist. He was so talented that people in the community would hire him to draw murals at their homes and businesses. He also had dreams of starting his own welding business. The bridge he was reported to be on is called the Horace Wilkinson Bridge, locally referred to as the New Bridge. 
It carries traffic in a total of six lanes across the Mississippi River, joining West Baton Rouge Parish and East Baton Rouge Parish. In 2005, there were about 107,000 commuters that crossed that bridge each day. There is no shoulder, which slows down traffic whenever there's a delay, and of course, also raises concern for truckers driving through, like we heard in both of those 911 calls. NBC News reports that responding officers found Jake's truck running, with its headlights still on. On the pavement was Jake's cell phone. The truck's gas tank was almost full, and officers found unopened packs of cigarettes on his seat that had been bought at a Port Allen Walmart less than an hour earlier. There was a small boat with a trolling motor in the back of the truck, along with an ice chest that contained fish. However, the battery that would be used by that motor and the fishing poles that would be needed to catch fish were nowhere to be found. A dive team was called in, but after searching throughout the night, found no trace of Jake. The family has also tried searching the river, but found nothing. A 2022 article at NOLA.com notes that the Mississippi River is extremely difficult for recovery efforts. There's broken concrete, metal cables, and exposed rebar on the water's edge, and the currents are so strong that anyone that winds up in the water is in serious danger, even if they're wearing a life jacket. A search and rescue expert calls the river a beast and says it doesn't obey a lot of the rules that other bodies of water do. The U.S. Coast Guard can't even provide data on the number of rescues that have been attempted over the years on the Mississippi. There are cars and entire trees hidden below the surface, making recovery efforts extremely difficult. Of course, this directly affects Jake's case. If we can't find him, how can we tell what happened? And while some people may think this seems pretty straightforward based on the 911 calls, there's someone that has more details that might change your mind. Ed Denzel, the host of the Unfound podcast, who we've had here on the channel a few times, interviewed Jake's mother, Tina LeClerc, on the Unfound podcast episode, Jake Latchley, The Public's Evidence. There, she detailed what happened during her search for her son and what she believes is the truth of what happened to him. After she was called and given the news about Jake, she drove right to his trailer in Port Allen. She was still hoping that this was all some crazy mistake. She thought there was a chance that she would find him at his home. Of course, Jake was not there, but his roommate Jeff was. Jake had lived with Jeff for a few months in the trailer park as he saved money to get a house of his own to share with his daughter. Jake was also due in court soon to discuss custody rights for his daughter, but what Tina found when she got to Jake's home convinced her on the spot that her son had met with foul play. Quote, When I got there, it automatically seemed suspicious. A window was punched out. There were holes in the walls. His personal items were missing, including his TV set, game console, and guns. Just everything was a mess, she said. Tina knew that Jake planned to go fishing and had bought the trolling motor that was found in his truck for that specific reason, but the bait that he planned to use on that fishing trip was sitting on the counter in the trailer. When she questioned Jeff about the state of the trailer and the missing items, he said that he had no idea what happened to the trailer. He went to bed one night and everything was fine, but then he got up and the trailer was at as Tina had found it. Jeff also stated that he didn't see Jake on the 29th. Tina also found Jake's orthopedic boot. Two weeks before he disappeared, Jake had broken his right foot. He was scheduled for an upcoming surgery to fix this, but in the meantime, this meant that Jake was unable to walk without using crutches or wearing that boot. Jake's crutches were nowhere to be found. Investigators found that the last confirmed sighting of Jake was on August 27th when he had dinner with his grandmother and his brother, both said he was in good spirits and that they had a nice dinner. As a matter of fact, we haven't found any information about Jake being diagnosed with any mental health issues, and his mother does not believe that drugs played any part in his disappearance, despite the assumption that she's heard so many times from people that learn about this case. She points out that this is a young man who was working several jobs and working towards a better future for his daughter. Tina thinks people shouldn't jump to conclusions until they've heard the whole story, and there is more to this story. 
there was another witness on the bridge that night. Around 2 a.m., Jake was seen sitting on the rail next to his pickup truck on the bridge. Someone reported that they even spoke to him, and he told them that he was heading to West Baton Rouge. Along with the two 911 calls, another call was received from a state trooper named Mark Bourgeois. He stated that while traveling in the eastbound lane, he saw the abandoned truck and there was a gray car parked beside it. Now, we do have that report that someone spoke to him on the bridge, but we don't have enough detail to really know if that person and their car is what was witnessed by the state trooper. And the trailer that Tina thought had clear signs of a struggle and possible theft, not long after Jake's disappearance, it burned down. We have no exact date for that because the fire was never called in. Tina was told that a nearby truck had caught fire, which in turn caught the trailer on fire, and any evidence of foul play that may have been in there burned with it. With no body, and now no possibility of collecting evidence to prove anything more, Jake's disappearance was categorized as an active missing persons case, and it's been that way for the past eight years. In the early days, Tina would rely on the police department's investigation, but it wasn't long before she says she was getting the runaround from them. To complicate things further, the police jurisdiction for Baton Rouge changes from the east to the west side of the bridge. Through the years, difficult cases that happen on or near that jurisdictional line get passed back and forth between the east and west departments. Whenever Tina would call, she would be referred to someone in the other department. When they were tracked down, she was sent back to the original department she came from, being told that they actually had the jurisdiction. After some time, and done playing this game of back and forth, Tina decided to handle the investigation herself. And through her own digging, she found a few things. Quote, After I learned about those two 911 calls coming in, I requested and got copies. Both calls came from the same number but were two different voices. Investigators say this is because the first driver used his CB radio to call another truck, and it was the second one who made the phone call. Which, quite honestly, doesn't make a lot of sense to me, even trying to re-explain that to you guys now. None of the caller's identities have been released, but when Tina called the number, obviously she recognized the number and saw that it was the same number for both phone calls, the person on the other end said they had no idea what she was talking about. Of course, there's also the question of what happened to Jake's crutches. Quote, if he had jumped off the bridge, his crutches would have been found. They would have been left in his room, by his truck, on the bridge, floating in the water, Tina explained. Five years later, Tina seemed to get an answer, but it's one that still doesn't sit well with her. One of Jake's aunts called her and told her, that she had his crutches, and they were sitting in her shed. Shortly before he disappeared, he left the crutches there, saying that his doctor had cleared him to walk without them, something Tina says could not have happened. Tina's heartache doesn't stop there. She chases every lead and rumor she comes across as she tries to find her son, but so far, none of these leads have brought her any closer. It also looks as though someone has stolen Jake's identity. She found that in 2021, someone received three stimulus checks for Jake. Quote, I'm not law enforcement. If I can find out this much, they can do better. They are not trying to solve this case, she stated. The Twitter account, at Jake underscore missing, makes it seem like no one's really investigating this from the law enforcement side currently. For now, Tina is left with more questions than answers. She said that there are people who indeed had motive to cause Jake harm, but without solid evidence, the case can't move forward. Of course, if the witness that spoke to Jake on the bridge that day is to be believed, there was no mention of anyone else being there with him. Was that call placed by someone else to throw off the investigation? Was the scene at the trailer indicative that something tragic had indeed occurred there and the scene at the bridge staged to hide that truth? Was the car seen near his truck part of staging that scene? Tina says, I'm ready for either outcome, but I need an outcome. I'm his voice. That's my son. 
God is not going to let me quit looking for my boy. She also noted in a recent Facebook post on the Jake Latchley Missing Facebook page, I haven't spoken in a while, but it doesn't mean I ever stop searching for the answers in the disappearance of my son. Everything reminds me of my son. Some may say it gets easier with time, but I say you just might get better at hiding your emotions because this hole in my heart can never be mended. Jake's name is profile states that he stands between five foot eight and five foot ten inches tall. He weighs between 130 and 150 pounds. At the time he disappeared, Jake had a broken foot and broken right thumb. He has brown hair and brown eyes, as well as a cross-shaped scar on his left wrist. He may have a short mustache and beard, and he smokes cigarettes. If you have any information regarding Jake's whereabouts, please contact the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office at 225-389-8617. The family is also offering a $5,000 reward for information that helps bring Jake home. Of course, if you want to follow their efforts, we have links to both their Twitter and Facebook account in the description box down below. And please help us keep awareness raised to this case by sharing this story with anyone you may know in Louisiana. I truly hope that some new information comes in to help Tina with her search for the truth and for Jake. Since 2015, we have always run limited commercial ads for the benefit of the viewers and the families we're trying to help. Obviously, we can't do that without support. A big thank you to PayPal supporters Sigrid E. O'Hearn, Angela Welch Sola, and Michael Johnson. If you'd like to help our mission, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee like Kelly E. recently did. We truly appreciate your support. Thank you to The Charlie Project, NamUs, Facebook, NBCNews.com, HammondStar.com, WAFB.com, Wikipedia, NOLA.com, Ed Denzel, and The Unfound Podcast for information contributing to today's story. Let's keep those eyes, ears, and hearts open and looking for Jake Latchelet. I'll see you again here soon on the Lord and Arts Channel.